we know God is going to guarantee that we'll have children. We trust God is going to guarantee he won't die young. But do you know that things happen? I want to challenge you as Christians to begin to think plan B in the sense of contingency plan. For example, yesterday, while the lecture was going, they talked about writing a way. Start thinking like that because that's how God thinks. Sometimes God initiates a plan and he fails. And then he's not shocked. He comes up with a second plan. Adam ate the fruit and the program he started failed. And then he initiated the second plan because the second plan was there from the foundation of the world. He said the Lamb of God was slain from the foundation. What it simply means is that they have planned that in case this guy blows up, blow up this plan, you, there is already an agreement, a second plan that will be put into motion. It's not just in business. You have to understand that. So, you have to understand that when you fall in love, there are risks involved. But you have to understand what covenant is. Covenant is security for both of us. What it means is that even if something goes wrong, this person will still be there for me, no matter what. If a business collapses suddenly, or I lose my job, and I'm not able to bounce back for a couple of months or even a year, or a particular challenge happens, I, I was imprisoned. Uh -huh. You don't, you don't leave your husband. You don't. He probably went into government politics and then got into some. And then they put him behind bars for two years. EFCC. You don't. You don't jive. Uh, they asked Jesus, "Can a man leave his wife for any and every reason?" And he said, "All the reasons are not good enough, except one. Normally, the only reason is there is death, and then the other party might want to continue and bring it." But Jesus now said. There is one reason why two of them are alive, and that is adultery. Because if they start entertaining reason, they will say, ah, did you see what happened? She grew fat. When I married her, this is not what I envisage. The thing has enlarged. Then you jive. Covenant is not self, it's not selfishness. The purpose of covenant is to destroy selfishness. Covenant is swearing to your own heart and changing not. Because God knows that leave men with their self selfish tendencies. They can make life miserable for others. Okay. So look at this part. To have and to hold. For better for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. From this day forward until they do us pass. Take note of that. Check out the second one. Okay, you know the scripture. A wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives. What it means if you swear that oath, that oath holds you. The law of covenant holds you till as long as your husband lives, but if the husband is dead, then that's when she is free to be married to whosoever she will. Notice that a Christian marriage is whosoever she wills. I know God guides you, but you are the one making the choice. So at the end of the day, you don't go ahead and start blaming him for you are the one making that choice with the guidance of God. Whosoever she wills, but within this boundary, only in the Lord. You know what I mean? There has to be another Christian. I was teaching this somewhere, and one professor said, I don't like you Christians trying to say, why must you be only, I said, I said, my friend, even in nature you can see it. When mango mates, mango, they say they mate with mango. The pulling grains are mango, mango. I said dogs mate with dogs, not dogs and, and cats. I said cows mate with cow. Eh? God created the law of kind. I said, for example, if you are in the old court, look for another lady that is also in water spirit. Don't go and look for a Christian. I said, can't you understand, sir? And, 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 and after I finished, he really li liked the idea. I said, you, for example, you know, he's also in the traditional institution in the village. You don't like, you don't want to serve God. You, you are into traditional things. 
then you go to church because you are looking for a Christian girl and collect one girl. And then she gets into your house, she starts praying in tongues and praying, and all your charms are spoiled. And then you, you want to kill her one day for, have you seen now? You think you want to cheat God, but you end up, you want to. Want to be a dog? Just get another dog. A pig? Find a pig. That's the law there. So, new creations. Marry who? New creations. But where you married as two old creations and one became new, God says, stay there. That the new will sanctify the old. Okay. I, John, take you, Jen, to be my lawfully wedded wife, my constant friend, faithful partner, my love from this day forward. In the presence of God, our family and friends, I offer you my solemn vow to be your faithful partner in sickness and in health. Now, this side is very important. I was in a in a wedding ceremony and the guy that was wedding was a preacher so when the minister was of giving the vow and got to in sickness and in health he said in health and in health the man said in good times and in bad times he said in good times and good times that's when i knew he was he was deliberate then the man said uh, in, in in prosperity and in poverty he said in, po in prosperity and prosperity I knew immediately he is an ignorant man. Because if his wife makes that kind of covenant, what he means, the day the money finishes, abandon us here and jive. If you fall sick in this house, I don't want wahala. This is not what I came here to do. Get up, my help yourself. What kind of wahala is this thing? A whole man, he abandons you and finds another man that is head. Because that's what he said that the but that he thought he was doing positive confession he doesn't understand covenant he doesn't understand covenant jesus christ entering we, you see this thing involves laying down our lives for others that's what god is trying to do that this person will not abandon you if the weather changes that's the kind of commitment you are making so in sickness and in health in good times and in bad in joy as well as in sorrow i promise to love you unconditionally to support you in your goals to honor and respect you to laugh with you and cry with you and to cherish you as long as we both shall live how many of you like this one resurrect the marriage covenant make marriages have meaning their vows make sense uh, some of the things that we are reading in Europe, even the languages, you don't know what it means. With this ring, I, I, de, I de wed. With this ring, I wed you. Stop saying nonsense. <laughs> Say something that makes sense. You know, a lot of people just do that. Thing. Say it fast. Let's get out of here. On the road to recession, they're already fighting in the car. Some of you are married. Need to... <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with you asking for a renewal of vow. I didn't say doing another wedding. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen. Okay, I John take you. I like this one. Look at look at look at to be my wife, my partner in life, my one true love. I'll cherish our union, love you more each day than I did the day before. I will trust you now especially for the man a woman is being administered this vow. this part is very important i trust you and respect you men need that laugh with you cry with you loving you faithfully through good times and bad regardless of the obstacles we may face together i give you my hand my heart my love from this day forward for as long as we both shall live what do you think about this one? It's good, isn't it? Okay, go ahead. 
I will be yours in times of plenty, in times of want, in times of sickness, in times of health, in times of joy, in times of sorrow. I promise to cherish and respect you, care and protect you, to comfort and encourage you, and stay with you for all eternity. Uh, God, my grand prayer, especially the eternity part. If you get to heaven, your two mansions will be together, I don't know. But it won't allow marriage there anyway. But it will allow friendship. Mm. It doesn't mean that when you get to heaven, the people you know become your enemies. If you know, you still know them. You still know. You still be your friends. But that special thing about marriage is what will be missing because it will be like family now. Okay. I like the idea of growing with you throughout the seasons of our life. You know, not trying to grow with you. Go ahead. I want to look at this one. Okay, I, John, take you, Jen, to be my partner, loving what I know of you and trusting what I do not yet know. <laughs> because no matter what has been shared, though, you better believe that there are things you are going to find out. I don't mean, but before marriage, I, I don't necessarily go about telling people you should tell everything about your life. No. But you should know that in covenant, anything that will affect two of you must be opened up ahead of time. Uh, you don't get married tomorrow. I find that you have had a child. If that will not be, you have started creating a relationship of falsehood. Or, you know, anything that you know that will definitely affect, or tomorrow I find that you don't have womb. Uh, you have started wahala. So you don't do that. You don't try that in Christianity. But some people want to know everything, who you have been with, all that. Me, I don't, I, I believe in what is, what is of good report, pure. Don't get my mind messed up. I don't, I'm not into, uh, it might differ for people, but whatever is of good report of this. If you're not a virgin, of course I'm going to find out, so you better talk. But, so you start telling me all day, I'm not interested. That's me. That's me. You know, so um, eagerly, I eagerly anticipate the chance to grow together, getting to know um, the man you will become, falling in love a little more every day. I promise to love and cherish you through whatever life may bring. Okay, so I think you have some ideas. There are a number of them there. Now, look at this part. After both have said vows they may wish to say something in unison such as look at this root naomi entreat me not to leave you or to return from following after you where you go i will go where you stay i will stay your people will be my people your god will be my god where you die i will die there i will be buried may the lord do with me and more, if anything but dead, part you from me. Do you know this last statement? May the Lord do with me and more. You, you keep seeing it in the Bible between David and Jonathan and a number of other people. Is God punish me if I go contrary to this? Well, that's the meaning of that. Hold me accountable. Okay, go up. Okay, look at this one. I, John, take you, Jane, as the love of my life. I vow to be patient with you. In the circumstances of our life, I vow to be kind to all the people we come across. There are some people during the marriage um, counseling, I find out that this is an issue. That because you marry a man, the man has had relationship, business relationship, all kinds of things. Some men get frightened that this lady is going to drive everybody away because of the type of person she is. Or, for example, you can imagine a young person has been passed through. There are all kinds of people. You don't just walk in because you marry, you destroy his life. Relationships are assets. What we say you should close are relationships that are emotional and maybe sexual. If you've been involved with a person to that extent, you don't marry and then keep those kind of, you are looking for serious trouble. Number one, you are even violating the. So you don't do that. 
Of course, for us who are Christians, you should have closed that when you married Christ. Not even when you are now meeting me. So the moment you marry Jesus, so such active relationships that are sensual and all that, closes. And then you start living a godly life, and then you meet. But let's assume that there were such things still going on. They should be permanently closed up. But it doesn't mean that people should lose all their friends and all that because you walked into their life. One lady will walk into office, slap the, the man where he was doing counseling and all that. Don't you understand? There's nothing special about being a pastor that you have to counsel males, females. There's nothing special. The profession could have been a nurse or a doctor. And, you know, it could have been another thing. You don't walk into a theater where they're operating and say, how can you be doing that? And slap the hell out of the man. You just need to mature. Well, not to be boastful of our love, about our accomplishments. I promise to be proud of you. I know I can, you know, striving for perfection. Not proud of love, do I will strive for perfection. I know I can never reach it. I promise not to be quick to anger, but to think before I speak. I just want to show you one more. Okay, this is the first Corinthian one. Yeah, that's it. First Corinthians 13. There are a number of vows, marriage vows, carved out from that first Corinthians 13 that listed as some of the elements of love. Like I promise to vow to be patient with you, to be kind to other people who come across, to be proud of you, um, not to be quick to anger, but to think before I speak or, or, or act. I vow not to keep record of wrongs, but to always keep happy memories alive. The type of wife or husband you marry, this might be the kind of vow they need. Because some people, this is where their wahala is. They can never forget. Ah, in 1968, this is what you said. They can't forget. Every little thing. Ah, 10 years ago, when we were living in Kafanchan, this is what you said. People just keep their water polluted with. That's not how to love people. Love does not keep record of wrongs. Love doesn't do that. Love forgives and forgets. These are the things polluting your a wonderful garden that you should be happy with. Marriage is a beautiful place. Okay. Okay, go up. I want to make sure that, you know, These are the normal European with this ring I D weighed. All my worldly goods I D endo. I like this. When you give rings, it's good to combine these two elements. With this ring I weighed the and I endo the with all my worldly goods. This will be good, especially where the woman is richer than the guy. It's assumed that when the man has the thing that is already ours. But when the lady has it, you better have a vow making sure that it's ours. <laughs> you said, no, this was not part of the contract. Oh. It's my money. <laughs> and if you're not ready to share, you're not ready for covenant. So, don't just say, with this ring, I wait the okay like the one we do with this thing i where i give it as a token of my love or my faith which i release to you is good add with my worldly good i adore thee or endure thee add it is important in sickness and in health in poverty or in wealthy dead to us part so spice of your uh, wedding whatever and as a pastor sometimes you look at people you, you see some situation you do a combination and you, people actually need to see their vows ahead of time before the day they take it they need to know and there might be things they need especially they personally and you make sure that there's agreement and that's beautiful before they come to take it you should see it 
Then the last one is that people too are allowed to write their vows. There are special cases where I do it. We let them write. And whenever people want to marry and they want to write their own vows, let them do it. Give them guidelines on certain things that must be elements of a covenant. Make them understand that. But then there might be certain things that are important to them. They need to do that because uh, a vow should meet the needs of the woman. It's a commitment of the man to meet the needs of the woman and the commitment of the woman to meet the needs of the man. When you know that the kind of wife you are marrying is hot head, stubborn, uh, you might want the person to include in the vow a promise that she will submit and respect. That when somebody tells me I'm five years older than him, I, I know I have to include some things in that vow. Because it's easier said. And then after this, I say, can you imagine this small boy? I'm even your. You think you can talk to me like this? The guy says, sit down there. I say, my food, no food. You are, he said, eh? sit what? I have two younger brothers that are your age. So I know I have to. <laughs> yes, because I know I have to include it there. I have to include them. And you know, so you can see some strengths you need to pull out. So I'm going to give you an assignment. Write a vow for a lady that is five years older than the man and has a tendency to write it also for a case of a woman that is stronger than the man. You can beat him. <laughs> Develop a vow that will fit that wedding. Another scenario is a case where the woman is going, actually, maybe for the next five years, she is the rich one going to be providing. Look at the kind of things they are going to be facing. Develop a vow for that. Then develop a vow for a male chauvinist. Those women as property, things to possess and all that. Develop a vow that will temper his commitments that will make sure that that woman is not going to live eternally in hell. That that woman needs to be met. Woman needs to be loved, protected, cared for. Develop the vow and of course the kind of vow the woman also should commit to. Develop it. I want to see this. We're going to make presentations in the night. Now, look at Develop a vow where there is a health problem. This is another case scenario. Health problem. It could be HIV. It could be, I've lost my womb while I was single. It could be my, the life I lived. It might not be. You know the kind of things that normally happen in such marriage that create, make the marriage people not happy. Every little thing that comes, the man starts saying, you even wasted your... You, you, no. When you make commitment to marry a person, even with the knowledge of their weakness, never use it against them. Never ever bring it up and start saying, eh, it's not because I married you. That's why I want you to develop for the woman that is richer. There is another case scenario in that group. The woman that is from a very wealthy family, maybe her father is a president, a governor. And she comes to marry you. And to maybe a nobody in the eyes of their family. And every time you say, ah, you know, because I even accepted to come down this level to get insulted. So what kind of vows, commitment, tempers? Because the people too should be happy. The idea of covenant is that they should be happy. The, the commitment should take care of the foundation, which is the marriage. Her father is the president. Her father is the governor. Her father is so wealthy and influential. Ambassador to this, to US. And you that just graduated, copper, just job seeker, got a job, that still pay you 35. You are believing that you will get a highly paid job. You are still working on your skill. Will you be married? And she comes from that high profile, Micah. King's daughter, Saul's daughter, and David, shepherd boy. But just that she sees potential in him, he could kill Goliath. Yeah, there must be something about this guy. How do you balance this? What kind of vows that make sure that things are? The two people's interests must be protected. In vow, you don't just say things. 
in a vow I commit to meet her needs so do you know what we did we sat down first before we went and she stated the three most critical things she needed and I brought her my own and we made sure that those things are incorporated in what we're going to be doing and there are commitments to meet it and commitment to repent immediately if I ever find out that I have violated it in any way because there could be such whatever and I just they don't need to be preached to once it, you find out these things brought up that you that means in that marriage the two people will be happy but their needs are being met so later uh, in the day I will show you child dedication because you also see child dedication is not just bringing a child a gift pastor you lift up and say I dedicate this child to the Lord mm -mm. dedication to start with is giving back to God what he gave to you that's what dedication means it, there is child dedication marriage dedication house dedication business dedication car dedication even dedication of life father I give you my life I commit it into your hand now you in dedication you give it to God you commit it into his keeping and uh, his saving keeping and protecting hands you want him to keep and protect this and what usually is kept in God's hand never gets lost now but in child dedication God doesn't just want you to come that's why there are two times you administer vows to couples first time is when they are getting married the other time is any time they bring a child to God and they want to dedicate the second set of vows is a vow to play their part why God plays his part to guarantee that this child turn out right and when you get to child dedication you see another triangle the vow ties three groups of people on one end is parents never forget what I'm telling you now because in case we never get to it again on the other end is what is called godparents godparents the principle is one person does not train a child and I want to advise you I want to advise you now because you may not have been practicing this don't just think that you and your wife have all it takes to raise your child your commitment is important but the reason God created the church is to give us additional support church is a community you might have something wonderful you, you, you've seen in PCJs you want them to also make commitment that day they will appear in the dedication after they've administered commitment to you or your wife they make commitment to help this family help you take responsibility for this child's upbringing and part of the commitment is that by chance something goes wrong and the parent dies they will guarantee that those ch that child will be brought up completely they won't miss school they won't miss school fees they won't miss anything if their parents were alive they already have second backup parents i told you contingency plan are you hearing what i'm saying very very important they thought now on the other third end of the triangle you know whenever you say child dedication people sing and come and then there are a lot of friends and well wishers that come out with them how many of you have noticed it's like that when you come to give thanksgiving for wedding in wedding too there are words that are spoken to the congregation and those friends families and well wishers they are the third group you admit a vow to them it's not they don't all have to take it if you know your enemy to the family don't take the vow is that it takes a community to train a child say it this is what is making the Jewish people they are, I told you that God's system is failure proof this is what is making the Jewish people no matter where even in America now it's hard to take the virginity of a Jewish young girl the reason is because they understand that it takes community they understand community it takes community to raise a child so what happens apart from the parents if my child is in school and she starts misbehaving maybe she's about to start having boyfriend and start partying guess what there are a few other families that are committed to our family to help us bring that girl up and in some cases what you find out is that one of them gets to find out they don't hide it immediately they come and send for the parents see what 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 and they don't wait till they even talk to you they immediately take responsibility 
They go, my daughter, come, they invite her to the house. This is not how we do in Christianity. God's people don't, you don't do this kind of thing. Don't get, get pregnant, do that. Mm -mm. Then number two, they get the parents to know what is going on in their child's life because that season of change, especially adolescent season, is a very crazy season. Then another thing that happens is that there is a partnership of teachers, the church leadership, and parents in raising children. Of course, we even used to have it here in Nigeria and in Africa that when your child gets to school and something, parents and teachers are in partnership. You know, you have parents teachers association. I don't know what is going on now. Schools are not just to be run by government. Schools are to be run in partnership of the teachers in the school, the administration of the school, the parents of the kids in school, and the church communities in that environment. Yes. Because there are three things to train to get a truly educated person. The training they had is one, information, education, and all that. There is the moral training. They need the input of the church. That's why there is a lot of curriculum. To change this country and change the value system, we have to reclaim back this aspect of family and community. We have to get it back. And of course, there is the training of hands. You have to learn a number of skills and all of that. So you don't just come out with books in your head and you can't do anything. You don't have relevant skills to succeed in life. I have my kids now. They are learning how to swim. They are playing keyboards. They are all kinds of things. These holidays, they've learned how to bake, all kinds of things they are doing. Those skills are very important. You don't know what it means until later in life. Sometimes it's even the skills that give you the money you need, not even the particular course you read. So, church community. Now, can you imagine now, I have to be in the U.S. with Pastor Sarah. We needed to be there. It's hard to fight. Okay, you have to be in this conference. Many of you didn't come with your wives, I noticed. Yeah, I, I asked one or two questions. Somebody said, ah, nobody to look after. Ah, nobody? You don't understand Christianity. You think Christianity is you and running a personal race like they've told you. There is side of personal race. There is community. If you, the community is not in there, we don't need church. Get born again. Be on your own. Read your Bible. Your heart. Pray. After all, God is in your house. Stay there. And there are a lot of Nigerians who don't go to church now, but they are Christians. They are getting frustrated because we are losing the essence of church. So some of them, church is almost not meaning anything. No. No. There are consequences when we lose community. Very serious consequences. You go to UK, these people are the most lonely group of people. You know, uh, you know family life cycle. You start out as a single. Then you couple. You marry. Then you have children. Then the children grow and leave you. You, you, you cycle now reduce you back to two. Then one of the partner will have to die before the other. It's on rare occasion, maybe accident or that, that the two of them die the same day, and leaves you back single. And then you're going to face old age, and in old age, the people that you once were looking after but in, are now to look after you. In their society, the cycle has been broken up. You get old, they carry you and put in one old home. We went to Ukraine, the part of Russia, where go, you see where they kept a lot of old women, a lot of old men, and are just there, very unhappy group of people. One was telling us, she has three kids, they have not she has seen them in the last 20 years. mother to come, you have to call, book appointment ahead of time. When you were in her house, eating her food, being raised by her, she was paying your school fee. How many appointments were you booking? I'm not saying that it's also nice if you can inform people that you're coming. That's basic. That's nothing. But Because it's something that God designed to be symbiotic. 
That's why your greatest investment is not the stocks that you have and the properties you bought. It's training your children. It's training your children. So part of what they do, the commitment there is to administer vows to parents to make that commitment to raise these kids to be a next generation of Christians. That means you have you, each family that is formed here means that the kingdom of God has enlarged. Because the fact that you gave birth to a child could mean that you have provided a body for Satan to use. Satan needs bodies to execute crime. He needs bodies to produce occult men. He needs bodies. He said, a body you have prepared me. Just like God is looking for bodies, Satan is looking. Evil spirits can exact certain level of influence till they have human bodies to use. Second option is animals, third is other things like trees and mountains and all. But basically their top choice is human bodies. So you could be multiplying bodies for the enemy. A body you prepared me is a woman that prepared a body for the Messiah. If that commitment is not there, so you know the children is not like what you like you drop. Children are heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb are his reward as gift from the Lord. They are things entrusted to parents to disciple. So you will see that. The same way is how, like I show you marriage vow, that's how there should be church marriage vow. That's what holds church members together. Membership of a church is not just a loose association. Not even Lutra Club and other have such, some of them have pledges, article of association. There should be things, shared values, shared faith, shared belief that hold the people together. There should be a church vow. That periodically, sometimes in your meetings, period, certain seasons of the year, the whole congregation is made to recite them again. It should be written. These are things that hold us together. There should be commitment. It's not just join. During the discipleship, new believers class, after you have taken care of their sin and all those in assurance of salvation, discipleship begins by now teaching people this thing so that they become part of the body of Christ. It's not just join. Is covenant, is marriage. Jesus, in laying the foundation of Job, brought 12 men from different bagger and brought communion to bind them. What, what, what he's doing is like, you don't assemble blocks and say this is a building. There has to be something between block and block. It's called cement or mortar. That's the holding, that's the job of covenant. Covenant is the glue. There should be that. Beginning of the years, ending of the year, certain seasons of the year, the women fellowship should have something that hold them. They should have a vision what they want to accomplish in society, what they want to accomplish in the church, then they should have certain covenant that hold them. And that is what will tamper the excesses of the human nature. The selfish tendencies there, our tendencies to fight, to quarrel, to, that's where you put the values that will tamper it. And, and, and like handle those things, the same thing. And for cell group, G12, pick one person and 12 people, bind themselves to look after each other to meet each other's name, to stand for each other, to pray for each other, and all of that. You start laying foundation for a very strong church, strong ministries that the enemy cannot take out. Think about one person being watched and looked after by 12 people. Where would the devil come from? One person can chase a thousand, two, ten thousand, you can imagine 12, combining their faith just to focus on one. When you are in hospital, those 12 people are the ones who have to be there, standing with you. When your business is going through challenges, they might even have to put money together to launch you back. When whatever. That's how God designed church to run. It's community. So the enemy is not able to come and knock out. Now let me tell you. In studying uh, Christian communities. The idea is that we go to the kingdom of darkness. We pull people out. But Satan is not allowed to succeed with one person in. Because he comes after your child. I'm him and him are also part of God's parents. Let me tell you what happens. When a child rebels against the parents, maybe certain things have gone wrong, trust have broken down, she doesn't believe they love them. You know, that a person is rebelling against one leadership doesn't mean they're rebelling against all leadership. There's always somebody else they talk to, they, they listen to. That's why you need God parents. Are you people hearing what I'm saying? Because most children, why the 
quarreling with their parents. They think their parents is hard. They always believe that uncle is nice. Because you know, uncle comes once in a while and buys biscuit, buys, gives it. But uncle is not the one that is there to discipline him every time. But then the commitment is that he now goes to uncle or uncle sends for him. You should have somebody you can call and say, please help me talk to Ada. We are facing some challenges. She's going out with one alhaji and we are tired of, and she doesn't want to hear. He says, my life, I want, please help me. Apart from pastor of the church. And these people who have been there stood with her, being her God, but, and they, they, they say, okay, let her come and stay with us just for a weekend. She goes. She comes back. She is back in shape. Because, and it could be them facing that. It takes a community to raise a child. Parents are involved. Teachers are involved. That's why we have to have very sound Christians. Believe me, you, you uh, apart from things like cost, like the university end, it doesn't send your kids here. I don't wonder what you are trying to do. That's the way it should be. Church is, is, doesn't just exist. Get people to heaven. It exists to get some heaven into the life they are living here. Amen. So, I have not shown you some samples, but you're also going to create for me a dedication vows kind of thing. But even what I've explained, you know what I want to look for. You know what I want to kind of put there. Deuteronomy 6, 4, to say, I ended there. That's one of the things that God gave the Jews. And it does not fail. So when you tell me, I, I, I had to travel. We can't. It's because you don't yet operate community. What you are saying, the whole church failed. There is no family in church who can help look after your kids. What happens if something goes wrong, if you are dead and gone? If you climb that aircraft and then, mm -hmm, so your kids are going to be orphaned. Then what does it mean to be part of a church? There are three groups. I said godparents. Godparents begins with grandparents. As long as two of you have any form of parents alive, they should be there in the dedication to also make commitment as we are dedicating our that, that they are taking responsibility to help in bringing the cleaning of Timothy now was more of 70% grandmothers and 30% mother. The godparents are also other people that are mature, that are in the faith and who also have probably kids. In some cases, they, are, they might not have, but who are making commitment to help. What is going on with our kids? It's not just us now. We have, have a number of people coming to teach them mathematics, English, every evening in the house, have different, we have teachers playing there, we have some other children's workers who are coming to make impute. A child, a Christian child, should not just have one parent. They should have many. Jesus promised you that when you leave everything and follow him, you are brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, houses. So I need a place to stay. There's nothing like I already have family where I can go. I say, child, they threw your parents out. Your children should not be left in the street. That's why you belong to church. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We are going to get back the Christianity that the Father and Jesus Christ designed, not what human beings have made of church. We are going to get it back. The type that society sees, and they want to be part of what God is doing. Church is not irrelevant. Church is a very important institution in every community and society. Houses. But I notice that in that place, everything was plural except one thing, wife. He so said, you leave everything for me. You get everything in plural, but you get wife. That thing is serious. God doesn't want wives. <laughs> Amen. So no assistant wife or deputy wife. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 5, 4 to 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Mm -hmm. Verse 5. 
thou shalt love now this is how you do parent this is one of the commitments you give to parents thou shalt love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind parents are to do this first what the purpose is not only for their own good so that they can now be the model of what they're about to teach the kids then go up yes and these words which i command thee this day shall be in thy heart so not only love god they are to keep walking god's way keep his commandments then go up and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy word the jews understand this thing i like that word diligently because it means do we like school i run bible schools in the house this holiday is now i just ran some uh, dli courses leadership courses for the kids last time i ran some and then i have something else to finish up before one of the things you have to teach is the ten commandments let me just mention five things that are very important to teach the kids one the ten commandments you have to from the one give them get the moral code into their spirit give them a, a, a foundation of values number two is um the redemptive plan of god they have to know what jesus did on the cross and all of that and actually as they get to a particular age they should be able to make that choice and give their life to christ of course number four number three is christian worldview is christian worldview christian worldview god created the earth heaven and the earth and everything in it christian worldview this with the source of everything source of life source of creation then not would you do well with calabash and the water not some of the folk tales they've told us in different places you know number two what what about things like um why is it that we have evil in the world did god create it then you point them to the fall there was a fall in heaven there was a fall on earth lucifer fell from heaven and then he helped adam on earth that's where we got evil crime everything the devil is behind it not god okay i know that did the devil spoil did god do anything or is he an irresponsible god the redemptive part see what he did how he sacrificed his son and daughter okay even if he did how come we still have problem because now is the his choice human beings have a choice salvation is a choice heaven is a choice hell is a choice yeah, whatever you know and you get and so on and so forth so you have to teach the christian worldview then it's important to let the child know that god has a purpose for his life and that there's something big he's going to be doing and that that purpose we have to do with affecting you know he said in this shall all the nations of the earth be what early enough is that letting them know that you are the one god we use to affect the world god wants to use you to change nigeria to impact that is a way a, a rule he has for you in life that god doesn't create any child unless he has a plan for the child and they start getting a sense of purpose and they will start as they grow part of the things that were going on in their spirits to know exactly what direction god want them to go some it might be ministry it might be president it might be to politics it might be this and then when children have this kind of thing you will not have to worry too much to get them to read their books to do other because you will let them know that what god wants to do with you will require acquisition of certain skills certain things to be able to do it now when purpose is is cast before a child it's easier to now put in certain things the child will be doing it knowing why there's a lot of things they told us to do it's now that I'm beginning to even understand the importance. Well, some of them I didn't do because, like, they are disturbing your life. You go and see other families and their kids are playing ball, misbehaving, and they are not allowing you to do what you want. You just see your parents like body. Because they didn't think that giving a sense of purpose was important. Things are easier when you know why. In all of this, it's important for the child to know that you love him, that he's loved and cared for, because that's what will make all the trainings and all the corrections work. Is this helpful at all? 
Eh? Is he useful? I think we need to learn how to do some of these things. God bless you.